So in the previous videos, we talked about the organs of the lymphatic system and the cells that populate them, primarily lymphocytes and uh, phagocytes. And in this video, we're going to um, talk about some general concepts related to the immune response and basically how we use the immune system to carry out defensive actions. Um, so basically what we'll do is we'll just give a brief overview of immunity and uh, just the purpose of it and then cover the cells of immunity and then uh, actually I'm going to talk about cellular or cell mediated immunity first and then talk about humoral immunity and immunoglobulins and then we'll kind of talk about what can happen when the immune system goes wrong. Uh, this will be like over a series of a couple of videos but um, but that's essentially what we're going to cover. So, like I said, first off, we'll just talk about immunity, um, kind of review the cells of the immune system, and then the very specific uh, responses uh, that are that are carried out. Now, one thing to keep in mind, I'll say this now, and I'll say it again when I, when, when I get to the appropriate time, that, um, that humoral and cellular immunity are specific immune responses that are carried out by different cells. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that even though they're different responses, they are occurring simultaneously. So functionally, they serve different purposes, but when, but when we initiate the immune response, we're going to see a combination of both uh, humoral and cellular immunity. Okay. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. Like I said, I will uh, reiterate that point more specifically when I uh, get there. So, all right. So immunity, essentially, is resistance to disease. Um, you know, basically... Part of immunity isn't just fighting pathogens when we are exposed to them, it's preventing, uh, it's preventing pathogens from invading our bodies and doing us harm. Um, when, and I'll review that in a second, but that's something to keep in mind. However, sometimes pathogens breach our defenses and we have to uh, be prepared to handle the invaders when they get in. Um, and basically these invaders could be in the form of you know, a virus, uh, bacteria, okay, various parasites, um, you know, like worms. Um, now, something to keep in mind as well is that um, is that invaders aren't the only thing that can trigger an immune response. Um, you know, basically, cells within us uh, can trigger immune responses as well. For example, when a cell mutates into a uh, like a tumor cell or a neo or a, a cancer cell, you know, kind of a, a you know neoplastic tissue, that is tissue that um, it originated within us. So it's not an invader. But uh, one thing to keep in mind is that when we talk about immune responses, we're going to talk about the specific actions of them and the and the specific. Um, basically how they're specifically initiated. All right, so that's kind of something to keep in mind is that not every immune, is, that, is that not all immune responses are triggered by foreign invaders. They're also triggered in many cases by, um, you know, basically items that we view as foreign that originate in us. But like I said, I'll talk about that more specifically in a second. Now, when an invader basically breaches our primary defenses, you know, um, you know, like our like our outer borders and whatnot. Uh, basically, there are different types of uh, there's two major types of immune responses or defense mechanisms that we have. There's what's called innate immunity or what we refer to as non-specific immunity, and then we've got what's called adaptive immunity, which is what we refer to as specific. Um, innate immunity, I just think I like to think of as like a physiologic containment responses, like inflammation. Um, uh, phagocytosis, um, you know, fever, uh, interferon. Uh, basically, those are all kind of built-in mechanisms that we have that, um, you know, that, that are more responsive to tissue damage and chemical mediators versus specific immunity, um, which is which is uh, response which which is an immune response to a particular molecule called an antigen, which we'll talk about in a minute. So again, let's kind of review. Uh, basically our lines of defense. Now, I, in the previous video, we talked about innate immunity. Um, and basically that innate immunity is, um, excuse me, is nonspecific. So basically, uh, remember, so when we're talking about specificity or, or, or responding to particular things, uh, when we're talking about specific immune responses, we're talking about responding to molecules called antigens. I'll talk more in depth about this on the next slide. 
but basically remember that an antigen is basically a, a marker or a molecule on the surface of a cell that the immune system uh, responds to, okay? However, there are certain defense mechanisms that do not, that, that basically do not discriminate and uh, are very generalized responses. That's what we refer to as innate immunity. Um, so the, our first example is just our initial line of defense, or our first line of defense would be the physical barriers of the body. And just to review real quick, remember the physical barriers of the body would basically be skin and mucus membranes. Okay, remember mucus, O-U-S, the adjective describing a particular membrane. Remember where you see mucus, that's the actual secretion. Um, but basically, these are just borders that, uh, that that basically don't allow, I mean, anything in or out, I uh, shouldn't say anything, but in terms of pathogens, when they are intact and they are functional, they are, it, it, they're, they're just walls, they're borders. Um, you know, for example, if I took a marker and I threw it against the wall in my living room, um, and then I took a pencil and threw it at the wall, and then if I took a, a, a ping pong ball and threw it at the wall, if I took a beer bottle and threw it at the wall, uh, neighbors probably think I'm losing my mind, but but the point is is that no matter what I throw at that wall It's not going to let anything go through it. It's just a barrier It's just physically there and it's preventing objects from passing through there. That's what our physical barriers do You know like skin all right mucous membranes kind of step this up a notch because um, Because mucous membranes are very sticky membranes that are found where the inside of the body is directly exposed to the outside world. So mucus traps pathogens and then there are various enzymes and antibodies and other materials within mucus that help destroy foreign invaders um, that get stuck in that, in, in, you know, inside of the mucus, all right? But again, there's no discrimination going on there, just whatever comes in contact with those, with those borders, uh, with those barriers, just isn't, it isn't allowed to pass. Now, that's, uh, now, however, that's why when you get a, a cut in your skin, now it's open season. So basically, that, that you're opening the door, essentially. Um, that's why, you know, for example, surgical rooms, uh, you know, operating rooms are, um, are highly sterile environments because when you have a person on the table and they are completely open, um, even, even if the, with the most minor surgeries, you can't have pathogens hanging out in there because, you know, like I said, you open up that skin and that's basically an invitation to allow pathogens in. That's why there's so much uh, uh, sterilization techniques that occur in ORs, all right? With mucous membranes, and mucous membranes dry out, um, or if there are diseases that affect mucous membranes, people tend to get infections a lot more easily, like respiratory infections and so on, because you lose that filter, that sticky membrane. All right, but again, I covered those already in previous videos, so that's about all I really want to say to that. And again, uh, sometimes pathogens do breach um, our physical barriers, and then that's where we have these innate um, physiologic responses uh, that we that, that basically, which are which I like to refer to as mechanisms of containment. All right, for example, inflammation. You know, so if you get a cut in your skin, you know, it's a, a, a sliver, uh, uh, whatever. You know, you sit on a thumbtack or. Uh, you get a sliver in your hand, you, you get a paper cut, you just, whatever it may be. A burn, uh, like a third degree burn or whatnot. Regardless, the, 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 the pattern here is that, um, you know, within a situation like that where you bust open skin, uh, pathogens can get in and if we can't fully contain them, or I'm, I'm sorry, they get in and then we uh, basically have mechanisms to contain them. Um, now, a lot of these mechanisms like inflammation are initiated um, by, you know, damage to mast cells and, you know, for example, if you take physical trauma to the skin and you, you know, rupture a mast cell, histamine's released. If you damage, um, if you damage cells within a tissue, a lot of material that's inside those cells can be released and then that triggers uh, inflammatory responses. I mean, inflammation is an incredibly complicated process, but you get the picture here. That, that basically there are, there are just certain inherent, innate molecular mechanisms to trauma and infection and damage and initial exposure to pathogens that kick in. Um, and then, uh, you know, if, the, and then uh, if an infection persists or gets beyond uh, just the initial stage of inflammation or if, you get a, or if you come in contact with a virus, you know, like you inhale a virus or whatnot um, and you get an infection, you can have a fever which is basically 
it, it's simply just turning up the thermostat, increasing your internal temperature, and creating a difficult environment for that pathogen to uh, thrive and evolve in, and making it easier for your immune system to attack. Um, interferon makes it difficult for viruses to interact with and, and with cells and infect them. All right, these are just innate mechanisms that, again, don't discriminate based on antigens. They just they happen. You know, like I said, there are various triggers. Um, you know, like I said, there are various triggers uh, from other cells or damaged cells that tend to activate these uh, mechanisms. And like I said, I'm not going into those in depth, but like I said, the kind of the common theme here with the second line of defense or these innate physiologic mechanisms is that we're trying to contain the pathogen. And the more we can contain that pathogen and prevent it from spreading, the better, the basically, the, the more, the better we can kill it, all right, the more easily we can kill it and basically it makes it easier for the immune response to uh, do its job. Now the immune response is carried out by T and B cells, or, or more specifically T and B lymphocytes. All right, remember, we have T cells, they're called T cells because they, um, they don't originate, but they mature in the thymus gland, they become immunocompetent. And B cells, uh, remember the letter B comes from, uh, remember the bursa, the bresius. luckily with humans, they also, um, uh, B cells become immunocompetent in bone marrow, red bone marrow to be specific. Luckily for us, bone also starts with B. So, um, remember the bursa of Fabricius is like a little kind of sac and, uh, and, and you found in birds kind of by their rectums. Um, that's where they you know, were initially studying these, uh, this process and, and whatnot. But anyway, um, but remember that, 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 T and when, that basically when T and B cells are activated, they are activated uh, when they see a specific antigen, a unique marker that is on the surface of a cell. Now, the key part of that is that, is that the third line of defense or the immune response, this is all about precision, okay? This is a precision type mechanism, okay? Whereas with innate immunity, especially with this second line of defense, these built-in containment mechanisms, all right, these are very generalized mechanisms that in some cases, or many cases, can cause lots of collateral damage. Like, for example, fever is probably the best example of that. Um, you know, whereas a fever, if, if we increase our body temperature too high, uh, not only the pathogen, uh, the, the pathogen will not only suffer, but our normal, you know, the cells within us can suffer as well, especially neurons. They're, they're going to be the most quick to respond negatively to uh, too high of a body temperature. All right, um, with inflammation, uh, excessive swelling can cause damage to uh, the tissues, make it uh, difficult to move if you have an inflammation in a joint. You know, that swelling can be, you know, can be harmful. Um, swelling in the spinal cord, if you have central nervous system trauma, can actually cause more damage. Um, so that's something to keep in mind that there can be a lot of collateral damage with this. When under, you know, when, when, the, when the immune response works under normal conditions, this is a very, this is like I said, this is, a, this is kind of like the, the, these are like the Navy SEALs or the Delta Force of our defense. I mean, these are the best of the best. These guys are, um, like I said, they carry out, um, you know, they're like the special ops cells of our system. I can't think of that. Sorry about all the military analogies. I hope I uh, use those correctly. But, um, but basically, they are going to carry out precision attacks against cells that's only against cells that see or that, that, that carry that antigen. Okay. Now, one thing to bear in mind about the immune response is that when we initiate or activate the immune response, then the immune response is going to persist until that antigen is eradicated. All right, so basically what I'm saying is, is that once the immune response kicks in, we don't shut it off until we are done attacking. Now, that's a good thing because we want the pathogen to be completely eradicated. However, that can be a bad thing when the immune system doesn't work properly and it attacks us and uh, basically an autoimmune disease. Um, so basically, now that, 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 that method of eradication is being turned on our own tissues, and that's, well, bad. Um, I'll talk about that more specifically later on. So that's kind of something to keep in mind is that, um, that, this, that this is a precision attack that discriminates based on exposure to specific antigens and is carried out by T and B cells. Whereas um, the second line of defense, um, you know, innate immunity in general, uh, is, is they're, they're just very general defenses, all right? Um, now, the cells of specific immunity, or uh, another word for specific immunity is adaptive, okay? 
And the reason why we're going to refer to this as adaptive immunity is the concept of memory. Okay, you're going to see that as I talk about the immune response more and more as I go through this process that that once we are exposed to a particular antigen, the concept of specificity is important. All right. All right. I'm supposed to say specificity. Sorry, it's a tablet. I can't stand this thing. Um, it's nice to have, but I just, you know, again, I, I, it makes my poor handwriting look even worse. Um, but specificity, so basically we respond to very specific antigens. And once we see that antigen and we, or we successfully eradicate it the, the first time around, we develop memory cells. So if we are ever exposed to that antigen again, we can even more precisely, more specifically, eradicated, I should say more quickly, um, because, because as you'll see, I'll talk about something called clonal selection in a little while, um, because the, uh, basically cells need to, uh, when we're first exposed to an antigen, or T and B cells need to genetically, uh, let me go ahead and say this, they need to genetically, let's just say program themselves to that specific antigen. So basically once we see that, ant so basically once we see that antigen once, and we respond to it, we fight it off. Now we have, a, we have memory cells that are already genetically programmed for that antigen and they know exactly how to kill it without wasting time. All right, and I'll, like I said, I'll talk about that. Uh, wasting time might not be a good way to say it, but, but basically, just more quickly. Uh, I'll talk about that more in a little while. All right, but cells of uh, specific immunity or adaptive immunity, um, remember T and, uh, B and T lymphocytes or T and B lymphocytes, now, there are basically two different functions uh, that these cells carry out. Uh, B lymphocytes carry out what's called humoral immunity, and T lymphocytes carry out what's called cellular immunity, or something, or another term for it is cell mediated. Okay, cell mediated immunity, they're the same thing. Uh, you know, they're the same thing. It's just to make sure you, I don't care if you're, you know, one of my students, I really could care less which of the two terms you use whichever one you're comfortable with, just use it in the right context. All right, um, now let's talk about this for a second. So basically, uh, B lymphocytes uh, pretty much carry out indirect, indirect attacks. Gosh, again, I apologize. Um, they carry out indirect attacks against uh, pathogens or specific antigens, and they do so through the use of, I'm just gonna abbreviate this, antibodies, okay, AB um, antibodies. Um, so basically, when, it, when we activate B lymphocytes when we're exposed to a, a particular foreign antigen, what B lymphocytes do is they basically turn themselves into antibody-producing factories, and I'll talk more about antibodies in a little bit. Uh, but basically, antibodies are proteins that uh, basically enhance and carry out our, enhance our ability to attack foreign antigens. And the word humoral, what we're saying here with this, a, a, a humor, a humor isn't just funny. A humor in biology is, uh, is a body fluid compartment. A humor is a body fluid compartment. All right, so remember that most of our, our, our immunocompetent B cells are stored in our lymphoid organs, like our spleen, uh, lymph nodes, uh, you know, pyrus patches, um, tonsils and whatnot. So basically what happens, especially like, let's say we activate a, a B lymphocyte in, 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 a, in a series of, in, in lymph nodes, okay? We activate B lymphocytes in lymph nodes and then they, they mass produce antibodies. And then what they do is they secrete those antibodies into the lymph circulation. And then remember, remember the uh, lymph will eventually circulate back into the bloodstream. And then those antibodies are circulated throughout the bloodstream, bloodstream and circulated basically to uh, everywhere throughout the body. And I'm gonna say everywhere basically into, and then they're distributed into, into all the major, into our body fluid compartments where those antibodies interact with pathogens, all right? So that's why we call that humoral immunity because B lymphocytes are mass producing and secreting antibodies 
into our body, into our body fluid compartments to fight antigens, all right? Whereas T lymphocytes carry out cellular immunity, what we mean by cellular immunity is that T cells actually attack cells. Okay, T cells actually attack cells, okay? They attack cells. And uh, good examples of this would be virally infected cells. If, remember, when, it, when a virus infects a cell, okay, a virus takes over that cell, all right? And then basically that cell is converted into a factory that produces more viruses. And then as these new viruses are produced, they escape the cell and infect surrounding and, and infect other cells in the area, producing more virus factories. You get the picture here. So basically what T lymphocytes do is they destroy the factories and therefore start to destroy the ability of viruses to reproduce, all right, once they've infected cells. Um, another, another situation is, um, would be T lymphocytes attacking cancer cells, all right? Remember, that's an example of an invader that did not originate within us. Um, so basically, T lymphocytes, um, you know, remember, cancer cells are, or I shouldn't say, it, it, I, good lord, idiot. Uh, let me say that again. Cancer cells are not invaders, but they're foreign, but they're, but they're, but they have foreign antigens, uh, and they originate within us. Sorry, that's better. Um, a little bit anyways. But basically, cancer cells are mutated cells, and basically, once they start to mutate, uh, they're just going to get unrecognizable to the body, uh, not just in, not just molecularly, but I mean, just in appearance as well. When you look at, uh, you know, uh, like a, a malignant neoplasm, when you look at a sample of uh, like a, a biopsy of a malignant tumor, I mean, the cells are just very alien-like in appearance. And part of that is, you know, the molecular biology of these uh, cells are going to change. And as a result, the, there's going to be antigens that the body's never seen and T lymphocytes are going to attack those. All right. Um, also, there are cells that act very similarly to T lymphocytes, to a type of T cell that are called natural killer cells, otherwise known as NK cells. They're nicknamed surveillance cells because these, um, what they do is they basically go, or they essentially survey cells of the body. And um, like I said, when a, you know, when, when we start, when cells start to mutate and reproduce, they have different antigens on them and natural killer cells are immediately going to attack them, all right? So they play a very critical role in, um, in basically preventing, you know, cancer development. That's why, like, for example, uh, you know, like in the early days uh, when, when immunology and aging were being studied and, they were, and, and scientists were removing thymus glands from rats, um, you know, rats and mice, that, uh, so think about that. If you remove the thymus gland, um, you know, you'd think, okay, well, there's really not going to be mature T, you know, that there's going to be a low amount of mature T cells within that, uh, within that animal. However, they were, they were noticing that they were still having kind of low rates of cancer or tumor development. And as a result, um, you know, the big part of that was because, and that's where we started gaining an understanding of natural killer cells. And the fact that we have these surveillance cells that uh, just go around looking for abnormal cells and wipe them out. All right. I'll talk about more specifically how they do that a little later. But one of the, but probably the most key or critical cell of specific immunity would be an antigen-presenting cell. Remember, these antigen-presenting cells are phagocytes. Okay, phagocytes. They eat things. These are cells that that consume foreign material. Now. They don't just digest and break down and kill foreign material. They take it a step further. And what they do is if, if, if they ingest a foreign pathogen, what they'll do is they'll take, that, um, they'll take that pathogen and they'll stick it on the surface of itself. Okay, they'll stick it on the surface of itself. And then what they'll do is they'll bump into both, they'll basically come in contact with T and B cells and now think about that for a second. Remember, what did I say before? The T and B cells are activated when, when we're exposed to foreign pathogens. Basically, what these antigen-presenting cells are doing is they're enhancing the activation of T and B cells because, um, because of the way certain receptors are built on T cells. T cells really can't be activated um, very well by just being exposed to pathogens alone. All right, they have to, basically, they have to be turned on by antigen-presenting cells. I'll explain that more in a second. 
All right, and then B cells um, have the ability to phagocytize pathogens and then start to develop immune responses against them. However, they just, it's, it's difficult for that to happen. And, and when that does happen, the response is very minimal. However, when we activate, you know, an antigen-presenting cells, they, you know, like I said, increase the ability to activate more B cells and T cells. And, act, and those antigen-presenting cells activating T lymphocytes is incredibly critical, which I'll uh, elaborate on more in a, in a, again in a bit. I know I'm just kind of uh, giving you a general overview of things right now. Okay. So, um, so those are basically cells of specific immunity, and remember that role of antigen-presenting cells. I'm going to talk about this more in a little bit, uh, the role they play. A little bit of terminology related to this. Uh, again, I already mentioned that antigens are unique identifying markers on the surface of cells. Um, now, a lot of times those markers are actual functional components of, of cells or, or living cellular organisms. For example, um, viruses, and uh, you know, I don't want to hear anybody saying, oh, viruses aren't alive, blah, blah, blah. It's, 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 it's a moot debate for this, because um, some people argue that uh, viruses aren't living, some people argue that they're living. There's decent arguments on both sides, but it's just, uh, who cares? Um, you know, realistically, what it boils down to is we need to understand how we actually respond to these. So, for example, like if you think of H1N1, I'm sure we've all heard of this, because the media, the idiots that they are, decided to create mass hysteria about this a few years ago. Um, you know, the government, you know, certainly didn't help with that. But you know, what, what does the government and media have in common? They're both run by morons. Um, but anyway, sorry, it's my two cents for this video. Um, but uh, but basically, what we have here, uh, H1N1, those are functional proteins that 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 actually the virus uses to do what it does. Remember, viruses basically take over cells. So H1N1, uh, the hemagglutinin and neuroaminidase. Hemagglutinin basically is a, is a protein that makes it easier for uh, viruses to bind to surface proteins on cells. And then neuroaminidase is a basically the, more of an enzyme that helps viruses basically escape cells once they're manufactured. And then once the viruses escape, they can go infect other cells. All right. Um, so even though those are functional proteins on the surface of these viruses, these are proteins that the human body has never seen before. So therefore, we are going to react to them. Okay, we are going to react to them because you have to bear in mind that basically, when we're by the time we're born, the immune system has basically, you know, during embryonic development, uh, has gone around and basically surveyed all the antigens on the surfaces of our cells and basically develops what's called a tolerance, okay? A tolerance to them, okay? So basically we have a tolerance to self antigens, antigens, okay? Now, that tolerance to self antigens is important because if we lose the ability to tolerate self antigens, our immune system will attack those, and basically that's essentially the what an autoimmune disease is. All right. Um, now, basically, now like I said, these functional proteins that are that are on this virus have not been seen by the immune system, so therefore we will react to it. We won't tolerate that antigen, and we will attack it, um, and we will attack it again for the purpose of eradication. We're not always successful. It's something you have to keep in mind is that there are certain pathogens that are good at evading our immune system or are just so virulent or deadly. Basically, they kill us so fast that the immune system just can't respond quick enough. All right, so that's something you have to keep in mind. But that, but 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 that's what that concept is all about. All right, um, you know, bacteria have a wide array of proteins on their surfaces. You know, um, uh, you know. Even our own cells have a bunch of proteins on their surface. You know, for example, the glycocalyx, kind of this outer kind of uh, uh, sugary coating. You know, basically it's a bunch of carbohydrates conjugated to proteins on the surface of these cells. That that acts as uh, kind of an identifying uh, you know series of markers on cells. Except, however, if they are you know our cells, we tolerate them. If we, you know, the, the proteins that are on bacteria, parasites, viruses, uh, uh, mutated cells from our body, you know, tumor cells, we don't tolerate those and we attack those, okay? Now, um, we don't just attack foreign antigens, we attack, we respond to, um, 
we don't just respond to antigens, we respond to very specific spots on those antigens, all right? And that's, what's, uh, that's what an epitope is. It's basically the region of that antigen that we react to. All right, now that's something to keep in mind because that's how specific the immune response is. All right, so remember earlier when I said that when we activate T and B cells, um, the very first time where we're exposed to that antigen, our response is going to be a little more slow because these cells, as they're, bas as they're basically dividing and undergoing you know, selection to fight that antigen, the cells have to essentially genetically program themselves to target that specific antigen. Now, let's kind of rewind here for a second. Remember the whole, remember the whole process that, or the function of DNA. DNA is a, basically a code that's used to make proteins, right? You know your A's, your T's, your C's, and your G's. All right, so basically when we react to an epitope or a specific region or spot on an antigen, we are basically down to the, I mean, down to the very basic building block levels, producing specific molecules to attack those antigens, you know, those epitopes, all right? That's why this is called specific immunity, because remember the purpose of DNA. We are, we are arranging the genetic makeup of T and B cells so they can produce the most specific proteins possible uh, so we can target them, all right? Now, there are some molecules that um, all by themselves are actually too small for our immune system to respond and react to. Those are what are called haptins. However, if these molecules combine with other molecules in the body, then we form a brand new molecule that we've essentially never seen. And as a result, well, guess what? I mean, remember, what is the, what is, what is the central theme behind everything I've been talking about here? We react to foreign molecules, foreign antigens, right? So, uh, for example, poison ivy, um, you know, basically uh, the kind of the, the, the you know, the, the quote-unquote poison um, from poison ivy, basically that uh, alone is too small to, um, for us to react to, but when it starts to combine with various proteins, you know, like in our skin and, and you know, the connective tissues in our skin, now we, now basically we form, now we form a complex that the body's never seen and we're going to react to it. Hence the inflammatory response, uh, you know, with uh, if we come in contact with that. Now, some some responses are more severe than others. I mean, I know some people that you, know, you wouldn't even notice if they rubbed themselves, if they came in contact with poison ivy, or you could be a person like me. If you barely touch it, you just you, know, you, go, you, know, you develop these big, you know, pus, you know, these accidentally rashes, and they're just not fun. All right. Um, another example is that there uh, sometimes there are certain medications or components of medications. That you know, after we uh, you know, use up those medications, there are certain components of those that are get into the bloodstream, and for example, could combine with platelets. Now, remember, platelets are just—they're not actually cells; they're fragments. All right, they're fragments that that are really sticky that combine together to uh, again form clots, so we can control bleeding. Now, uh, now sometimes uh, with certain again, there's there's kind of a handful of different medications that can trigger this, from aspirin to. Uh, you know, anti-seizure medications and so on. Um, you know, basically there are, you know, like I said, certain components of those medications that when they bind to uh, platelets, we're going to form, again, a molecule we've never seen, and as a result, we're going to respond to it. And in a situation like this, this could cause us to attack platelets and cause, um, you know, destruction of platelets and cause thrombocytopenia, basically bleeding. Or basically, not well. Uh, that's a low platelet count, which will make you more susceptible to bleeding. So, um, so basically, that's kind of something you have to keep in mind. That there, what happens is that they're molecules that are too small on their own, and then uh, when they combine with other molecules, they form something foreign that the body has never seen, and then we react to it. All right, and then the situation, like with um, you know, with the medications uh, causing thrombocytopenia, it's a pretty simple fix. You have to just don't. You just don't take the medication, and then you know typically people stop, you know, stop the reacting, and then they're typically fine. All right, but that's uh, but that's basically what happens are. All right, um, specific immunity. Now there are certain um, surface proteins or surface molecules that are found on cells that are. Um, it's basically uh, that come from a family of genes. If I remember correctly, chromosome number six. Um, 
called the major histocompatibility complex, or what we refer to as MHC molecules, or MHC proteins. Um, so basically, these are these are essentially protein complexes that are formed in cells, and then kind of, uh, and then they are uh, kind of uh, sent to the surface, or, or uh, uh, you know, the surface of, of cells. Um, and the immune system, basically, there, there's there's two major classes that are important to humans of MHC proteins. MHC1 and MHC2. Uh, MHC1 proteins, these are molecules that are found, um, you know, within all body cells, all right? So basically, these are these normal markers or normal molecules that we normally just want to leave alone, all right? Now, a loss of MHC1 molecules or MHC1 proteins on our cells is going to result in an immune response and an attack because remember those natural killer cells, those surveillance cells. That's one of the things that they that they're that they're doing when they're surveying, you know, quote unquote surveying, is that um, you know when they with, you know if they see a mutated cell that is missing normal MHC1 proteins, again, that's that's something that the body's never seen, um, and as a result, we're going to attack it and you know try to destroy it. And in many cases, we will destroy it. All right, MHC2 molecules. These are found on antigen-presenting cells and uh, and T cells. All right. Now, there's something to keep in mind here that these are critically important because the interaction of these MHC molecules between T cells and antigen-presenting cells is important because the interaction of those two is essentially what activates them. Okay, it's essentially what activates them. Now, there are certain other markers that are found on these cells, for example, um, that are uh, important for um, basically kind of co-stimulation or they're often called co-receptors. Uh, for example, we would say that T helper cells are CD4, all right, we would say that they're CD4. Um, and then we would say that uh, cytotoxic T cells are what we call CD8. All right. Now that's important because um, again, that's important because when this uh, basically when uh, an antigen presenting when an MHC2 molecule from an antigen presenting cell comes in contact with a T helper cell. In order to activate it, you know, this CD4 molecule is also involved as well, all right, um, when processing that antigen and activating it. And then now the CD8 uh, molecule, this is important because cytotoxic T cells, I'll cover this more later, uh, carry out direct attacks against cells. And those CD8 molecules basically are important for, you know, the... Uh, uh, Allowing cytotoxic T cells to attack those, so basically, kind of it plays you know that plays a role in the attack process. All right, so basically, kind of the theme to take away from this is that there are very specific molecules that are involved in the activation and initiation of the immune response. All right, remember MHC one molecules are found on practically all body cells, and uh, MHC two molecules are found on T cells and antigen presenting cells. Okay, now. It's very important to understand the concept of antigen processing, and uh, I figured out how to use the uh, sketchbook app on my iPad, so I'm starting to make images for these presentations. Uh, so basically now, instead of having third grade level art, I can now bring you about seventh grade level art, um, or whatever, I just, I'm a horrible artist. Um, but basically, uh, remember, remember, antigen presenting cells are phagocytes, right? They're phagocytes, you know, macrophages, dendritic cells, um, and so on. And remember, for example, uh, remember when we were thinking about the general structure of a lymph node, okay? When we're thinking about the general structure of a lymph node, there's these bean-shaped organs that have many afferent vessels that circulate lymph within them, all right? And then remember that there are a lot of uh, phagocytes that kind of surround the periphery of these, um, of these lymph nodes. So basically as fluid or lymph enters the node, all right, one of the first cells they're gonna come in contact with are phagocytes. And if there are any um, pathogens found within there, uh, within that fluid, uh, then obviously phagocytosis is going to occur. And you remember how this process works. Um, you know, basically when a, when a foreign molecule uh, comes in contact with a phagocyte, 
the phagocyte will create an invagination of its cytoplasm and basically engulf, um, basically engulf that foreign object and then uh, put it in what's called a phagosome, okay? And then basically that phagosome is going to fuse with a lysosome. Remember the word lyse means to break, okay? So basically this is a, this is a little uh, um, pouch that contains lytic enzymes. Enzymes are designed to break down organic uh, material. And basically that pathogen will be essentially digested, broken apart. All right, and what these antigen presenting cells will do then is they will take some components of that pathogen and then they will basically stick it on its surface, on its MHC2 molecule. All right, they'll stick it on an MHC2 molecule and then what they're going to do is they're going to hunt down T cells. All right, they're going to hunt down T cells and try to activate them, not just T cells, but also B cells as well. Okay, so basically, now one thing to keep in mind is that T cells essentially, I mean, for all, for all practical purposes, can't really be activated unless antigen presenting cells process, a, process some kind of antigen and then show it to the T, you know, to T cells, or specifically T helper cells, all right? B lymphocytes can phagocytize foreign materials and respond on their own to pathogens. However, this just increase this process here increases the exposure um, of B cells to that uh, to that foreign antigen, therefore increasing uh, B cell activation and uh, increasing the amount of antibodies we're going to produce. Okay, so that, so kind of keep that in mind that 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 concept of antigen processing is really important because, like I said, we can't really activate T cells without it, and this enhances B cell activation. All right, so kind of before we get into the specifics of humoral and cellular immunity, let's think about some mechanisms of activation then um, of lymphocytes. And this kind of goes for T and B cells. And I actually already pretty much just explained one of them. Um, basically antigen, uh, antigen processing by phagocytes and then antigen presenting by them. All right, now, like I said before, T cells, uh, you know, can't, they, T cells need to be activated by these. Now, I'll tell you right now that 75, I'll come back to this concept in a second, 75% of T cells uh, that are, the you know, uh, T cells that are found in our body are what are called T helper cells, all right, inactive T helper cells. So basically these immunocompetent uh, T and B cells that have never seen an antigen before are what we call naive, okay, they've never, they've never uh, come in contact with a pathogen and had to respond to it. So basically, what this antigen presenting cell is doing is it's using its MHC2 molecule to um, basically show this uh, T helper cell a foreign antigen, right? And so basically the MHC2 molecules uh, of these two cells interact with one another. And then, like I said, remember that CD4, okay? That CD4 co-receptor is very critical as well. Because basically, when you put the two together, um, basically that that essentially activates T, the T helper cells. All right, um, and then basically once we now these are called T helper cells because these cells uh, essentially dramatically activate and enhance so many so many functional aspects of the immune response. They activate more T cells, uh, T helper cells create the bulk of the activation of B cells, all right? That's essentially what I'm showing you here in this image here. This is supposed to be representing the T helper cell. So once a T helper cell is activated, it's going to release just this array, I mean, it, just this bath of chemical messages, you know, lymphokines, cytokines, and so on. Um, I'm not going to go into these in extreme depth, but basically these chemical messages are going to do a lot of things and have, you know, uh, activate more macrophages and phagocytes, therefore activating more antigen presenting cells, activating B cells, activating cytotoxic T cells. I know I haven't talked about the specifics of all those cells yet, but, but you get the picture here. So, so it's very important that these antigen presenting cells um, process, process pathogens and antigens and show them the T helper cells so we can carry out the immune response because, um, like I said, I mean, cyto excuse me, cytotoxic T cells and B cells really can't do a whole lot without the help without the help of T 
T helper cells, all right? And then this, I drew this really disproportionately here, but this middle one here is supposed to be an example of a B cell. Now, B cells have a wide array of, I mean, they've got a very diverse array of receptors um, found on their surface, all right, that are very sensitive to um, foreign pathogens and foreign antigens, okay? And uh, basically, when a B cell comes in contact with a pathogen, like I said, it's going to phagocytize that pathogen and then process it itself and then start manufacturing uh, specific antibodies to that pathogen. Now, like I, kind of what I was talking about a second ago, I mean, this, so basically B cells can come in direct contact with a pathogen and you know, start producing antibodies on their own. However, this effect is going to be minimal at best. Okay, it's going to be minimal at best. Uh, like I said, most of the B cell activation comes from T helper cells, okay? So when T helper cells are turned on, the, the various chemicals they secrete is going to activate a lot of these naive B cells and then get them, and then basically get, get them involved in the process of response, uh, responding to foreign antigens, okay? Now I know a lot of stuff in this video so far has been very general or basic, but these are very, very important concepts to really understand before we really get into the specific responses, you know, humoral and cellular immunity, you know, this concept of, uh, of basically uh, responding to antigens, the, 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 this, this idea of, of precision attack. Um, basically, it's important to understand how these cells are activated. Like I said, most of the activation is done by antigen processing and then the activation of T helper cells. And then T helper cells, um, basically they secrete various chemicals that activate cytotoxic T cells and B cells. They have, you know, they come in contact with, T with receptors on cytotoxic T cells and activate them and B cells as well. I mean, the, the T helper cells are critical, are very important. And then, like I said, B cells um, can react directly to antigens by phagocytes. Well, can, I should say can be activated directly by antigens, um, you know, by phagocytizing them and, uh, pro you know, genetically processing them themselves. But like I said, that is, uh, like I said, that, that's minimal at best, okay? So that's essentially uh, kind of a general overview of the immune response. Now let's think about, um, let's kind of think about uh, basically cell mediated immunity and um, uh, cell mediated immunity and uh, humoral immunity. Um, but I'll do that in another video. I'll keep these kind of shorter.